Well, here's where we are so far in our studies. Truth begins in the mind of God. He reveals that truth to his people by a process of revelation. And this revealed truth was written down by divine inspiration to form a canon, a standard of truth. The inspired books have been preserved for us down through the ages so they could be translated and then interpreted to teach and to warn God's people. Now, uh, the problem is we don't have any of the original documents of the books of the Bible, the autographs, the things actually written by Moses and Isaiah and Matthew. Uh, we have copies, which we call apographs. Uh, apo means from, so they're copied from the originals. Uh, and the copies sometimes have copying errors in them. When people copy things down, they may skip a letter, they may uh, misspell a word or something. And so a flaw in one document gets passed on to all of its copies unless somebody makes a correction down the way and say, oh, that's wrong, I've got to fix that. Well, in the Old Testament, uh, copying errors are extremely rare. Uh, the scribes were extremely meticulous in making copies of what they believed was the holy word of God. Uh, they would even check their work, uh, not only by careful proofreading, but they actually counted the individual letters and they compared the results with carefully maintained records of how many Hebrew letters there were in that particular line. Uh, most of the copying errors, though, have to do with spelling uh, errors and, and such. Let me put up a little graphic here. Uh, most of the differences between manuscripts in the Hebrew Bible have to do with uh, uh, copying the Hebrew letter Vav and Yod. Uh, now, these letters were little hooks at the top of a vertical line, and uh, the Vav extends down to the baseline, and the Yod uh, extends only partway down. So it's easy to see how they're confused sometimes. Uh, now, the actual Hebrew pronunciations are what I use, the Vav and Yod. Uh, European influences made some academics later call them the Wow and the Jot, but uh, those are more Europeanized and have been abandoned by modern Israel as they tried to go back to the original pronunciations of these letters. But uh, other spelling errors also have occurred uh, because there wasn't any universally accepted standard. They didn't have dictionaries they could all go to and they wrote things down and copied things. And at times the spelling of words in different regions and all was a little different. But um, when we compare uh, all the different copies that we have, uh, we can see that there are really very, very few uh, actual differences in the copying uh, of the text. Uh, sometimes, though, Bible critics, because they didn't like what the Bible said, have conjectured, well, Isaiah must have meant this, or Moses, or the writer of the books of Moses must have meant this, and so they make suggested corrections, conjectural emendations, they call them. And they're suggested to make things fit better with their own uh, theories about the Bible. And uh, there's an amazing uh, lack of doubt, though, about what the original text of the Old Testament said. Uh, let me show you a copy of the Old Testament uh, in Hebrew. This is uh, the, the Jewish scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, those written before the time of Christ. And uh, if you notice in the very bottom of the text, I, I know you can't really see it too well, but there are footnotes down here. Uh, these show the corrections that have been made by various scholars and where sometimes the manuscript will be a little different than the other. So you can actually see where these differences occur and compare them with the actual uh, printed text, uh, the one in this edition which is up here based upon uh, some very well documented and accepted uh, copies of the text. So uh, when the existing copies are, are compared with one another uh, and historic testimonies considered about the copies that we have, uh, we can be very certain that what we have is essentially identical with the original autographs of the scriptures. Uh, Kennecott's Hebrew Bible included readings from over uh, 600 surviving Old Testament manuscripts which were compared. Now, get these numbers in your mind for a minute. Uh, in those, there were about 284 million letters, that is individual letters uh, uh, from the Hebrew alphabet in these manuscripts. And in those 284 million letters, there are about 900,000 variations. Well, that sounds uh, bad, but about 750,000 of those are just trivial variations between the Vav and the Yod. And so the remaining variations that occur are only within one or two little manuscripts out of the 600 that we had. And so uh, we, we can say that there's 
just about no variation at all in the text. We can be very, very confident that what we have is what Moses wrote, what David wrote, uh, what Isaiah wrote, and so on. Uh, in fact, uh, Dr. John Skilton from Westminster Seminary wrote a, a paper called The Transmission of the Scriptures. And in it, he was uh, analyzing some studies made by Dr. Robert Dick Wilson of Princeton years ago. And he was commenting on this Kennecott's Bible. And here's what he says. There are hardly any variant readings in these manuscripts with the support of more than one out of the 200 to 400 manuscripts in which each book is found. Well, since then, we have the Qumran fragments and scrolls, the Nash papyri, many others that show a very low level of variation within the copies we have of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, we uh, uh, see the divergence maybe in one or two copies, but then when you compare them to the hundreds of other copies, uh, some are much older, we can actually see oftentimes where an error occurred in copying. And so where the divergence occurs, uh, we can easily reconstruct the original text without much problem or doubt at all. Uh, some examples of the Hebrew text uh, where there's variation show that somebody didn't have a particular portion when they were making their copy, and so they translated it back into Hebrew from another language where a translation had been made. And so you're going to get different words when you translate out of one language into another. And then without having a copy of the original to translate back again, you might pick different synonyms or word order and so forth as you try to put what's in one language into another. Uh, one of the, our best confirmations is called the Isaiah Scroll. And in this Isaiah scroll, uh, we have uh, a copy well-preserved that contains the entire book of Isaiah. It was dated uh, by uh, various methods. Uh, the date was calibrated primarily by repeated carbon-14 tests and paleographic studies because we know the type of material it was written on, the style of letters and so forth, which tie it down to being a copy that goes back to about 100 to 200 B.C., so this is written actually before the time of Christ uh, in that intertestament period, well preserved, and it's often uh, been put on display in various places for people to come and look at it. Now, uh, there was also a Septuagint, uh, a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible that was being used in, the, in that period of time, and it goes back uh, uh, the period before the time of our Lord's birth. And in the Septuagint, we have a lot of differences. As you read the Greek text there, you see there were different translators of different books of the Old Testament when they translated it from Hebrew into uh, Greek. In fact, sometimes you see they translated from another uh, language into the Greek because of the variations that we have. And uh, so you had differences that are going to occur there. But most of the differences in the Septuagint are because of careless translators or copyists. It's not an infallible uh, version of the Old Testament, it again needs to be co uh, compared back with these uh, authoritative Hebrew copies that God has in his providence preserved for us today. Now Jesus and the apostles in the early church were confident that the text they had of the Old Testament was uh, fully accurate and had complete divine authority. That's the way they quoted from it. Uh, they quoted as if these books they were referring to were infallible and that's how they refer to them, as a reference back to the Old Testament text that they had at that time. Now, dealing with the New Testament, we have many more ancient copies than we do of the Old Testament, because, of course, it was written more recently. And uh, this is a, a Greek New Testament. And again, uh, the, the text that was in this edition is up here. And at the bottom are these footnotes. And the footnotes tell where variations occur. And it actually gives which manuscripts they're different from. So we can see that, well, these were all in the area of one particular region of the world, and they all probably have this difference because they were copied from some original in that region. Uh, we uh, see also it tells us that this verse was quoted this way by Origen and Chrysostom and uh, Theodoret and some others. So these are very helpful so we can see again where variations in the text occur. There, there are well over 5,000 major epigraphs of the New Testament text that we have today. I know one source said there were 5,686. Well, we're finding new things all the time and uh, reclassifying things. But of those containing entire books or groups of books, no two copies of the uh, Bible are exactly the same before the time of the printing press. Uh, 
And uh, But again, most of these variations are very trivial, and they only have to do with spelling or maybe a letter left out or something. Uh, most significant deviations in the text are isolated to single copies or groups of copies that can be easily uh, compared and corrected. There are several causes that we keep in mind for these copying variations when they occur. A lot of them are just accidental errors that occur when a copyist maybe mistakes one letter or word for another one, or he maybe substitutes a, a similar word, a synonym, without realizing it. He might skip a letter, a word, or a portion because he looked away or got distracted. And uh, sometimes uh, he would realize what he did and write the skip portion in the margin with an arrow, and somebody reading it later wouldn't know that was a skip portion, might think it was just a, a, a notation made by the copyist, and so they wouldn't include it when they uh, copied from that text. Uh, sometimes the uh, a word's copied twice without realizing it, or letters copied twice, uh, gets things out of order sometimes when, uh, again, a scribe has been working all day. And uh, with the New Testament, they weren't as meticulous about copying letters and so forth and counting them as they were with the scribes of the Old Testament text. Uh, some uh, were just plain making copies, though the church might have a copy that they could read to their congregation when they got these letters from Paul and such. But um, uh, th those were similar things that occurred in, in every writing of ancient times, and we can see them in, in the writings of other uh, ancient writers as well. Uh, I, I could show you, for example, some of the marginal re writings that were found in the, the Codex Sinaiticus. Let me put a, a picture of that up here for you. Uh, so you can see what these marginal notes look like. Uh, this is taken from one page of Codex Sinaiticus. And you see there's marginal notes. And it's sometimes very hard to know what was a correction of the text or what was just something that someone wrote in there as a marginal note or maybe... Uh, they realize that there's a, a verse in the Old Testament or somewhere else that makes a comment, and they wrote that in the margin, then later it gets copied into the text. So uh, for this reason, we have to be very careful about how we deal with these variations and see where the variations actually came from so we can deal with them effectively and responsibly rather than just rejecting everything that uh, seems a little bit out of the ordinary uh, as if somehow now the Bible's not reliable. It is. The variations are very, very small. Now, we've attempted also to group together uh, the New Testament epigraphs into different text types and families of texts. More recently, computers have been used to sort through databases of these texts to find patterns and simplify the, the problem a little bit for us. But scholars take different approaches. There's always that human element, where now we have to take the data and organize it into what we think are, are decent categories. And the scholars take different approaches. There's no simple formula for classifying the variations that we occur. Now, there are some uh, classic divisions of the New Testament text that are still widely used uh, by a lot of people, and they can provide some help. For example, we speak of the Alexandrian manuscripts of the New Testament. Uh, they're very old copies, and they're uh, based on copies made in early Alexandria in Africa. And attempts have been made to divide this text type into subgroups, but uh, uh, that's been a difficult thing to agree on. Then there's the Byzantine manuscripts. Uh, these are much later copies, but they were made copies from ancient texts, and so they do have some ancient uh, anchor to them. Uh, they're more uniform, uh, and uh, they make up the majority of the existing Greek manuscripts that we have. But this group has also been divided up by computer analysis uh, into very hard-to-manage subgroups. And even among the Byzantine manuscripts, there are many variations in the text because, again, humans were copying and they weren't being clicked out of a computer printer or a printing press. Then some speak of the Western and Caesarean manuscripts, uh, uh, that's a class that now has uh, been sort of rejected by a large group of scholars. Uh, but nevertheless, these show what was being used, what texts were being used more broadly in churches around the world in different locations. Uh, some presume that God supernaturally preserved the text used by the majority of the churches. Find the majority text, they say, and that's the one that God uh, says is absolutely infallible and uh, has been preserved. <clears throat> And so um, they argue that this majority reading must be the perfect text, so like taking a vote and 51% uh, wins. But th this really ignores the facts. And this is where the King James only and the Texas Receptus movements have gotten started. Uh, 
Uh, they consider these to be divinely preserved and perfect texts of the New Testament and the Old Testament. However, when these texts were made, they were based on only very few manuscripts that were known at the time, and they're not as uniform as the supporters seem to imply. Uh, they represent the majority of copies in one geographic area, but uh, when you consider the whole geographic spread of the New Testament, they're not the majority text being used by the church at that time at all. In some parts of the text, we know now, were back translated into Greek from Latin, with absolutely no Greek support as to what the original inspired words were. Well, it helps to see some of these texts and, and to consider how they were influenced uh, by earlier texts and how later versions were influenced by the earlier ones. Um, Fenton John Anthony Hort and Bishop Brookfoss Westcott published several textual canons. These were rules that they believed were important in analyzing the manuscripts to reconstruct the original text. Now, many of their canons have been modified since they wrote them, and some are now completely discounted as being invalid. But their work uh, stands as a helpful foundation for the continuing work of analysis of these variant readings. Uh, they had a, a couple favorite uh, Old Testament, or rather, not Old Testament, but uh, texts of the Bible that they use. Let me see if I can find a picture of those and put up for you because it's very, very helpful to see these. Um, let's see, I think this is them. Yeah, here they are. They called them the Heavenly Twins. Codex Sinaiticus, which I mentioned p previously when we looked at the marginal notes, and uh, Vaticanus. And they called them the heavenly twins. And at times they blindly accepted any reading that was found in both of these very ancient copies of the Bible. Uh, but they have a lot of marginal notes and notations in them, making them far from a divine standard. Uh, now, not all the texts found in one place at the same time are of the same type. They uh, often agree with copies found in other places. And they might have been brought there from some other place. Uh, they might have been copied from the same earlier manuscript. And so for that reason, uh, we have to take a look at the actual content as well, not simply at uh, where it was found or the age of it. Uh, one example is the Codex Alexandrinus. It's a 5th century manuscript of the entire Bible, both the Old and New Testaments. But it agrees more with the Alexandrian or with Byzantine text in places than it does with the Alexandrians, uh, even though it was found down in that region and uh, has been classified among those in the Alexandrian uh, portion of the world. And so it shows us that uh, we have some homework to do to really piece together some of the things that uh, God has preserved for us in these various copies of the Bible. Now, there are some uh, printed copies of the Bible when the printing press came into being, which help us a great deal to be able to uh, follow now uh, the way in which the Bible came down to us. Let me put a few pictures up here for you. It might help a little bit. Uh, back in uh, 1450 to 1456, the Gutenberg Bible was printed. But it wasn't a Greek or, or Latin, or I mean, it wasn't a Greek or Hebrew version. Uh, it was Jerome's Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible. And they uh, printed it from existing texts of the Latin Vulgate that they had at that time. And then uh, around 1488, the Lombardi Hebrew text of the Old Testament was published by the Sassino Press. And in 1514, Ximenes produced his Complutensian Polyglot. And what this was, it's a text that had the Hebrew, the Aramaic portions, uh, and Greek, and Latin. So it was translated into these four different languages so you could compare them. And then in 1516, Erasmus produced his first complete Greek New Testament. It was about a thousand pages long. But it was primarily put together by comparing two manuscripts that he happened to have in one of the Book of Acts from the 12th century. Uh, he had another incomplete text of the book of Revelation, and so he back-translated uh, from the Latin Vulgate back into the Greek again. Now, his second edition in 1519 was the basis of Luther's German translation of the Bible. His third edition in 1522 added a portion, uh, 1 John 5, 7 to 8, with a note that he believed it was a fraud. I'll mention more about that later. Uh, in his fourth edition, in 1527, he included ideas that were based on the polyglot. Uh, some of the alterations of the book of Revelation, for example, he changed about 90 places in the book of Revelation to adjust it back to the polyglot version. 
And in his fifth edition, uh, that was in uh, 1535, not much has changed, but he eliminated the Latin portion of it. But uh, the text of Erasmus was based upon only very few Greek copies that were available at that time as ancient copies. <clears throat> then came uh, Robert Estienne, and uh, he's often called Stephanus. And he produced four editions from 1546 to 1553. Uh, his third edition showed variations in the margin that were done by friends of 14 different codices and the polyglot and, and uh, Bizet. His fourth edition was the first one to introduce verse numbers into the text. And uh, the one he produced in 1553 uh, was uh, the one that was used in translating the Geneva Bible. And he produced that in Geneva as his third edition. The Geneva Bible was actually translated and made available in 1557. That was the Bible that was used by the pilgrims when they came here. It was the one quoted by Shakespeare and such. Uh, then Beza produced nine editions uh, in 1564 to about 1604, <clears throat> his tenth edition in 1611. And uh, he also had some new manuscripts available that he compared, but his published text is very close to the fourth edition of Stephanus. Uh, the King James Version of 1611 was based on Beza's edition of the Greek text. And uh, in 1624, uh, the Elsevier brothers, uh, Bonaventure and Abraham, produced a Greek Testament based mainly upon Beza's 1564 edition. And in the preface to the 1633 edition of their, uh, their work, uh, he promoted it as the text which is now received by all. And of course, the Latin with there was textus receptus, received text. And so that edition of uh, the Elsevier text became known as the Textus Receptus. And many b took that to mean that it was the text received by all the churches and therefore divinely inspired and, and preserved. But it was received because there weren't many alternatives available at that time. It was a collection of several editorial editions that had been made, and it was not the majority text before then because the church didn't have it before then. The textual basis for the Textus Receptus didn't even exist until the time Erasmus, Stephanus, and Beza edited together the existing manuscripts that they had. But there have been some recent finds that have helped us a great deal in uh, improving our knowledge of what the original actually said. Uh, let me put up a picture here of some of the more recent findings that we have. Uh, these are some very ancient pieces of copies of the New Testament in Greek. Uh, 7Q5 was a fragment of the Gospel of Mark, verses uh, 52 to 53 from Mark chapter 6. And we've been able to date it by the style of writing and by the papyrus that was used, that it was probably written uh, probably no later than about 50 AD. And so this was probably copied during the time when many of the apostles were still alive. Uh, P52 is a second century papyrus and it's just a fragment that includes John 18, th verses 31 to 33 on one side, and on the reverse side, verses 37 to 38. So uh, by piecing that together, we can kind of reconstruct the size of the original page. This was found in Egypt. But these help us to confirm the early circulation of the same text that we have basically today. Now, when I was a, a Bible teacher, I had a class of about a oh, hundred students that came through my room, different classes during the day. And uh, I was trying to explain to them how the original biblical text uh, had come down to us. And so I had the students take part in a demonstration, which we found to be very helpful. First, I wrote a simple paragraph on a piece of paper, gave it to a few students to go into a side room off my main classroom and make copies of the text. And after they made the copies, uh, I took the original and I hid it in my desk drawer. And then when the next group came in, I took those copies the students had made and I selected a few students out of that next class and sent them into a side room to make copies. Then I took their copies and each generation was numbered so I know who, uh, you know, what order in which they were copied, uh, which is more information than we have on, than a lot of the uh, copies of the New Testament, but uh, it was just so I would know to give certain copies to certain people as they came in. I kept doing that until uh, all of my students had made copies. There were a couple where I had a student go in a side room with one of the copies and read it out loud 
as a group of maybe six other students wrote down their copies of what was being read. That's the way some of the copies of the New Testament were done, by a reader and then a group of copyists all copying at the same time. But I collected all these, and when I was done, I had all the copies made by the students in the original locked on my desk. I then selected from those copies, some from each different generation, and kind of mixed them up a little bit, and I presented it to the class, now reconstruct the original paragraph. Well, they compared, and we had some uh, little humor as we realized somebody totally miscopied a word here and there, and it got copied in the copies. But by comparing all the different texts that we did have, and I didn't give them all of them, just some of them, uh, they were able to exactly reproduce with complete confidence what I had in my desk drawer, which I then took out and said, okay, here's what the original said, and here's what you say it said. Look at that. You've reconstructed it completely, even though there were flaws in the copies that were made. By comparing the text in this way, this is how we try to make sure that what we have today is, in fact, the same as the uh, text that was written originally by the authors of the Bible. Uh, the autograph we don't have anymore. We may not even have many, but maybe one or two of the first generation copies, maybe none of them. But the copyists then would compare the copies they had and make their copies, but those were lost. And so what has come down to us today are copies of copies. By comparing them, though, we can go back and reconstruct what the original said without uh, any real cause for doubt and worry. <clears throat> and we have biblical uh, sound uh, evidences, some good uh, foundational texts that show us that this is a valid method. Let me show you, for example, what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, he said, uh, and, from, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But remember, Timothy only had existing copies of the Old Testament. He didn't have the original autographs as he was growing up. They'd been lo lost long before him. And the expression that Paul uses here, he says, the Holy Scriptures, uh, ta hira grammata, and the other expression, all Scripture, pasa grafe. These were well-established expressions used at that time to refer to the Old Testament books. They used those words like we use the word Bible today. And since the only texts available to Timothy were these copies, not the originals, yet Paul still said that he should consider them authoritative for correction and instruction. And therefore, we say, a quality of inspiredness adheres to the copies that Timothy had used then. This verse shows that what we possess is still fully authoritative and is an infallible guide to God's truth. Our imperfect copies were so superintended by God's providence as to give us a solid foundation. Now, Peter also made an interesting comment. And, of course, we know that Peter was, in fact, uh, an eyewitness to what Jesus said and taught. And in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 19 to 21, here's what he wrote. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so like Paul uh, Peter also uses the term scripture, graphe, and he applies it to both the Old Testament books and to the New Testament writings that were being inspired at his time uh, when he referred to them. And Peter calls these scriptures a word confirmed, that is more sure than even his own eyewitness account as a man. Uh, he could only have been referring to the existing copies available at that time. The full authority of God is extended to the copies that were available then to the church. Now, Jesus many times quoted from the Old Testament. And, uh, in fact, in John 10.35, he quoted from the Hebrew Scriptures, and he called them your law, the Word of God. And yet, all that they had were copies. That's all that were available to him and to his followers and to the Jewish scholars that he was correcting at that time. 
These sample testimonies of Scripture, along with many other verses of Scripture that are like them, confirm that there remains a quality of inspiredness that adheres to the copy of Scripture. This means they continue to be God's Word for us today. But in summary, we can say that we're, we're very confident in the text of the New Testament and the Old Testament that we have today. Uh, even critics that argue about uh, the text are quick to remind us that all the variations affect no doctrine of the Christian faith. Uh, very little of the text is actually in question, and most of the variations are so trivial they don't even affect the translation of the text. They're just little spelling variations and such, word order. Uh, those that do uh, uh, affect the translation of the text are mostly isolated to very few individual manuscripts and are easily identified as variations. There are some large portions that are more serious variations. We'll take a look at a few in a moment here. But even them, they don't affect any of the teachings of the Scripture. But uh, they need to be each considered on their own merits. Uh, we'll look at uh, how the support for each one uh, is distributed uh, as far as like uh, worldwide, you know, where did they have these same uh, question portions in Alexandria and in Caesarea and in Byzantium and such. And by comparing like that, we can also see how wide distributed these particular ones were. But uh, we examine how well supported these in individual variations are, uh, how widely distributed they were, and by looking at the context, we can see if something is totally out of the flow of the author's purpose and what he was writing about, and yet it only appears here in this one manuscript. So we can pretty much say, okay, that was something somebody inserted maybe from a marginal reading or somehow just got in the text but didn't belong there. But there are some specially pragmatical texts that uh, we need to look at. And uh, the detailed analysis would go way beyond the scope of our little study here, but uh, I'll give a quick summary of a few of these question portions. Let me put them up here for you. Let me uh, call up that graphic here for a moment. And we'll take a look. I'm not going to read all of it because there's an awful lot of uh, reading there, but I'll, I'll go over them briefly with you. <clears throat> the first one is uh, in 1 John verses five, um, chapter 5, verses 7 to 11, called the Coma Johannium. It has no sound Greek manuscript support whatsoever. Here's what it says. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Now, Erasmus, when he was uh, doing his text, didn't include that verse. Uh, it was only found in Latin translations. But Stunica, uh, one of the editors of the Complutensian uh, Polyglot, uh, came to an Erasmus and he criticized him for not putting that in. He said, it's in all of our Latin texts, it should be there. Well, Erasmus uh, said he would only include it in his Greek Testament if he could show him an actual Greek text that had that verse in it. Well, it's said that uh, pretty soon he came back with, uh, with a Greek copy. Uh, some said the ink was still dry, or still wet, rather. Uh, so, Erasmus reluctantly added it to his uh, next edition, the third edition of 1522. But he added a notation. And in the notation, he said, this is a questionable text, probably back translated from the Latin. Uh, it's in many Bibles today because that particular edition of uh, the, the uh, Erasmus Bible was actually the one used by the King James Version in 1611. And so it got used there, but uh, even many King James Bibles will have a footnote annotating saying that that did not uh, come from any original Greek text. Uh, but remember, even though it talks about the Trinity there, this verse was not used in the debate about the Trinity. It doesn't contain any information necessary for developing the details of the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, it was not used uh, for that particular purpose. You could take it out and all that we believe about the Trinity still stands fully documented in the Scripture. Now, there's another text here I wanted to uh, take a look at. Uh, this is a little longer one. Uh, it's in John chapter 7, verses 53 to uh, chapter 8, verse 11. And it's a portion about the woman taken in adultery. Now, I'm not going to read that section, but uh, several ancient manuscripts differ about this portion, and those that include it are in worldwide distribution, which lends support to it being an ancient reading. But some ancient copies omit this section entirely. Uh, 
copies that don't include it are mostly from one region of the world and they trace back to very early apographs. So both those who reject it and those who accept it agree that no teaching of scripture is affected either way. Uh, but still, it's a very ancient record and seems consistent with uh, some of the things that the Bible teaches about the legal process of adultery and such, if it's properly interpreted and understood. Mark 16 is an interesting one. Uh, it has to do with this longer ending of the Gospel of Mark, and it's missing from two very old Alexandrian texts and some other early epigraphs. But it's included in the majority of the Byzantine and Alexandrian texts. Uh, for example, the Alex uh, 5th century Alexandrian uh, text that we mentioned before. Uh, it's not mentioned, though, in the early writings of the church. And shorter versions of Mark's ending appear in some other manuscripts. So some have rejected this section of Mark, but they do because of its content. And it depends on how we interpret it. Uh, some uh, see it mentions speaking in tongues and casting out demons uh, and not being harmed by deadly snakes or poisons and miracles of healing. Uh, and, and so they reject this portion because the Bible doesn't support that these supernatural abilities would continue on throughout the whole church age. Uh, the, the purpose then was to confirm the new revelation being given at the time by Jesus and the apostles. And so the context indicates that this portion of Mark was written as a promise only for the apostolic age, which was just then beginning when Mark wrote this. And so there's no problem with the content of the text as long as it's properly interpreted. So uh, it could be that some out of prejudice simply took that out because they didn't understand how it might fit in. Uh, and so uh, theologically they eliminated the text. Now there's another portion in Acts chapter 9 verse 6 that has a longer portion of that verse that's in the King James Version uh, that's not found in any Greek manuscript whatsoever. Uh, and it also appears to have been back translated into Greek at a later time uh, from the Latin Vulgate. So there are Greek copies, but not ancient manuscripts that include it. Uh, the uh, ESV, the English Standard Version, uh, translates it this way, and this is based on the Greek text. Here's what it actually says. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. But the King James includes a part added from the Latin versions, and it reads this way. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Well, the longer portion is probably introduced because it comes from Paul's defense in Acts chapter 2, verse, uh, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 22, verse 10. Uh, there he was talking about his conversion experience. And therefore, the facts of what it says here aren't in any question uh, in what the King James has there. Uh, but even though there's no evidence that it belongs in this particular verse in Acts chapter 9, we know from what Paul said in Acts chapter 22, it's, it's a true statement and uh, produces no difficulty if inserted there. So just these brief summaries of fascinating studies uh, of, of the text are interesting, but they affect no doctrine of the Christian faith whatsoever. And so we should not worry that God has not, in fact, providentially preserved the text of the Bible to provide us with thousands of copies to compare. And we can be certain that our Bibles are without error. They, can, they tell us things which we confidently can know are what God wants us to know about himself, about his plan of redemption, about the church. So in God's providence, we have an enormous amount of material to look at. I wanted to put one last graphic up here, which is kind of interesting. And uh, it shows comparing the copies that we have of the, of the Bible with copies of uh, other ancient pieces of literature. And as you can see by the big yellow dot, which are the number of copies we have of the Bible, compared with the other size yellow dots of what we have of uh, like Aristotle and Euripides and the writings of Caesar and Sophocles and Plato. And the distance from the original, uh, the the time elapsing before the original copies, or these rather the, the apograph copies of the New Testament and Old Testament were written, very, very close to the originals. Whereas the copies that exist of these other documents are many, many centuries divided from where the original was actually penned. And so we have great confidence uh, of what we have before us, that the text of the scripture is precisely what God has preserved for us, and we can be confident of what it says. But in our next study, 
we're going to take a look at the translations of Scripture and see how it is that God has provided translations for us who don't know the original texts uh, to read them. And so those of us who don't know Greek and Hebrew have translations. And we'll see how translations are made and what principles the Bible gives us that governs how translations should be made. Thank you, and uh, Lord bless.